Leslie Earl Maxwell, our grandfather, was born in Mentor, Kansas on July 2, 1895, to Edwin and Marion Maxwell. He was the eldest of nine children. As a family, Ellie said they were a nondescript lot, not closely knit, with nothing unusual about their average run-of-the-mill lives. He described himself as an average sinner, son of an average farmer with average parents and an average family. Average. Although both sets of his grandparents became God-fearing, Ellie's childhood home was generally godless and rough. His grandfather, Maxwell, aware of this, began praying for him when he was born. His aunt, Christina Maxwell, also prayed for him daily for 20 years. L.E. recognized God's mercy on him all through his youth. For example, around age six, he was with two older boys who dared to swim a swollen river. He was about to jump in and prove himself as brave as they, when they hollered back to him, Stop! The current is too strong. Leslie was not convinced, but suddenly... God mercifully filled him with overwhelming fear, and he backed away. At about age 11, evangelists came to town preaching hellfire and brimstone. While generally not an effective approach, seeds were planted about life after death. Later that year, Leslie's nine-year-old brother was killed when he fell off a wagon and the wheel ran over him. Adding to the grief for L.E. was knowing Ernest had taken his place that day on the wagon. Losing little Ernest caused their dad to make a single statement about eternal issues. They say if they die before they know better, they will go to heaven. Maybe Ernest went to heaven. Leslie cringed knowing if Ernest went to heaven, he would not see him again. In his late teens, Aunt Christina found him a job in Kansas City, Missouri. This was a merciful lifeline for L.E. and changed the direction of his life. After attending church with her, one night he knelt by his bed and simply prayed, Oh God, forgive my sins. Soon after this, L.E. was drafted to serve in World War I in France with the U.S. Army. Although he never met another believer during those two years, he knew God kept him from sin and kept him alive for a purpose. So, on returning home, he planned on training for ministry. With limited funds and the need to now care for his widowed mother and many siblings, he applied to Midland Bible School in Kansas City, led by Dr. Stevens. His ambition was for overseas work. He practiced stern self-discipline to make ends meet financially and to be a ready soldier of Jesus Christ. In February 1922, Stevens approached L.E. about accepting a request from Fergus Kirk for a teacher for two years to teach Bible to young people in Three Hills. It was not a simple decision. L.E. saw four barriers to this. He didn't want farming didn't want cold, the cold northern climate, and he didn't want to teach or preach. These required a lot of dying to sell for him. Ultimately, he gladly accepted the invitation. In describing Ellie's response, Stephen says, Maxwell springs to it. I can see him doing that. Stevens then creatively merged the third and fourth year classes into one long year. This moved Ellie's graduation up by a full year. Ellie Maxwell's enthusiastic yes for two years extended as he settled in and embraced God's plan. And I would say he said he continued saying yes for all of his years. In mid-August 1922, just six weeks before arriving in Three Hills on September 30, 1922, Grandpa wrote, I am just completing my Bible course. I have had a full consecutive study now of all the Bible. People need the Bible, so I am glad I have gotten the word in its simplicity. I'll never run out of a message. Gratitude for studying the whole canon of Scripture became a conviction, 
resulting in the Bible emphasis here at Prairie. When Pearl Plummer, a fellow student, first spotted L.E., she knew this was the man God had for her, but she kept it to herself. Interestingly, L.E. had a similar experience when a thought suddenly impressed him. Pearl is to be your wife. Shocked, he waited and prayed for a month before he approached Pearl. Imagine his surprise to learn God was ahead of him on this. So he headed to Canada as an officially engaged man, not knowing a three-year delay was ahead. Looking back on the beginnings of Prairie, L.E. was keenly aware of God's work in bringing Prairie into being. Decades later, at the Kirk's 50th wedding anniversary, he commented, God arranges and prearranges movements of people, letting them see only a part of his ways. He gets hold of a person, gives them a vision, puts a burden on them, and then draws others in alongside to fill out the pattern, the plan, and the picture. Setting the stage for this picture included God moving the Kirks to Three Hills, Dr. Stevens to Kansas City, and Leslie and Pearl to Midland Bible School. It also involved God giving the Kirks a vision, Fergus Kirk a nudge to write asking for someone to come and teach, and causing Dr. Stevens to approach L.E. God was at work in the backstory. Just nine days after he arrived, the first Bible class was held in the McLaren farmhouse with eight people in attendance. This was October 9, 1922. Often these classes concluded with sessions of prayer and waiting on God. Through this, God established the vision, teaching them to put first things first in their lives. Already, they were, as a community, experiencing the cross. A salary for this teacher was not always an option, but Ellie was given food, housing, and a warm welcome in homes. Instead, They did life together. Early on, God spoke to L.E. about serving without expecting anything in return. It was God's work to provide for him. God was drawing L.E. into his much larger plan for this school on the prairies. So it was that L.E. and Pearl, after getting married on April 12, 1925 in Iowa, returned to Three Hills and as a young couple, they lived with the McElherons. After their first child, Eleanor, arrived, they moved to one room in the new school building. After Ernest arrived, they moved to a small house and eventually to a larger house for their growing family. Together, L. E. and Pearl agreed. Pearl would focus her attention on the family and not be involved in the public side of the school. What a wise decision! Grandma Maxwell beautifully fulfilled this responsibility. Her ability to care for her family and stretch the pennies is legend. I personally watched her take threadbare collars off Ellie's shirts, reverse them, and stitch them back on so they could last another winter. Self-disciplined habits shaped Ellie's life. Walking three miles a day, early devotions each day, listening to the news three times a day, cooking breakfast cereal, and going to bed at 10 p.m. Those were a few. Evening visits in his home usually ended with him saying, Well, folks, let's have a word of prayer before you leave. Guests knew it was time to head home. He tried it on his children when they came back for visits, and it failed. They told him to go on to bed. They weren't finished talking with each other. And he did. Ellie enjoyed the outdoors and physical activity. Known for being energetic, whether behind the pulpit or outside, rain or shine, blue skies or blizzards, he walked every day as long as he could. Seeing him gardening or shoveling ice and snow off the sidewalks was normal around campus. In early years, he wore a a knee-length fur coat to stay warm. Big flaps on his fur hat kept his ears warm. His hunting trips stopped only after losing one eyesight, 
or sight in one eye, sorry, still committed to getting outdoors and providing meat for his family, Ellie took up fishing. Personally, I think he really loved fishing. As the school grew, so also did the responsibilities Ellie carried. The rhythm that would span many years was set. Preparing lessons, teaching, speaking, writing, traveling, institute meetings, reading widely to keep up on current affairs, appointments with students, and eating meals in the dining room with students. All was part of his normal life. As you can imagine, this was unsustainable. L.E. was burning out. A wise doctor ordered him to cut back on his schedule and to break away from daily work by taking meals at home. This delighted his children, and Grandma Maxwell didn't mind either. Grandpa grew in his journey with Jesus through humble responses to personal conviction. One example came from our dad when, as a small boy, he was weeding the garden alongside a friend. Grandpa walked by on his way to the office and wasn't happy with the weeding job they were doing. He got on to Dad about it. Ten minutes later, he came back from the office and apologized for his harshness. Dad's friend stood there with his eyes wide open listening to this. Afterwards, he said, That was amazing. My dad would never apologize. Regarding Prairie's distinctives, L.E. shared how God convicted him of pride in three things. One was the book, Born Crucified. And if you haven't read this book, I would strongly suggest you read it. The worldwide impact of Born Crucified is larger than we will ever know. But this wasn't L.E.'s message. This was God's message through him. This book impacted Frida, a secretary at Moody Press, She was heading to Nigeria with SIM. As she proofread the original manuscript, she thought to herself, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a father like this? Little did she know, the author's son, Ernest, was headed to Nigeria with SIM, and God had designed them for each other. That secretary was our mother. This picture was taken when L.E. visited Nigeria before our parents were even going together. Another area of pride for him was the concept, hoping for nothing. Although this concept kept expectations focused on God, L.E. realized being proud of humility is as dangerous and destructive as being proud of achievements. The third one was the missionary distinctive of the school. Missions was a primary way through which God was reaching the unreached. Yet not all were led by God to go overseas, including Ellie and Pearl themselves. They had both wanted to go overseas. Obedience to God's call was what mattered, whatever the cost, and wherever the path led. Grandpa was out walking when he gave in to God on these. He raised his hands in surrender and admitted his guilt of pride. In that moment, he experienced the cross of Christ dying to himself, and he experienced the life of Christ moving on in freedom. Galatians 2.20, his life verse, challenged and shaped him throughout his life. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave his life for me. As much as he focused on the crucified life and the cross in the life of the believer, he didn't stop there. He went on to talk about those who, having died to themselves, needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit and live lives of glorious freedom from self alive to God. Often class ended with him saying, God bless you to death. And all God's people said, and the class responded, Amen. L.E. loved studying and teaching God's word. I think Romans was his favorite book. He allowed scripture to explain scripture. His study of scripture was paired with extensive reading of many books on other topics. He looked at current issues in light of scripture. Because of this, he became known for holding unconventional views. 
Armenians accused him of being Calvinistic. Calvinists accused him of being Armenian. He believed extremism on non-essentials was wrong. He valued balance in topics that weren't core issues and called keeping balance the hardest thing to do. This is a fun picture portraying something he was deeply committed to. Staying balanced meant holding in tension opposing views and being willing to not be in one camp or the other, even while moving forward. He realized anyone can take a belief or opinion and turn it into an extreme position simply by not considering what is true about an opposing perspective or what scripture might say on an opposing perspective. In class, when he responded to questions that were obviously heading down a singular line of thinking, it was normal for his response to to support the opposing line of thinking. He did this lest we as students think we had figured everything out without considering another viewpoint. On core issues, he stood firm, and he was careful to not make everything a core issue. Ellie preached with great zeal and fervor. He did not stand still while preaching. Once Alan Redpath, the pastor at Moody Church, had to ask Grandpa to please stand still while he was speaking at the Moody Conference. Why? Because the little Mike couldn't pick up his voice when he moved all over the platform. Grandpa's humility is visible in his telling of this story. He didn't feel bad about himself and the restriction. He felt bad for Alan Redpath having to ask him as the main speaker to stand still. Leaving Nigeria and moving in with my grandparents in the summer of 1971 was a big step for me. I was tired of boarding school and looking forward to living in in a home and being a high school day student. But I was shocked to run into the interpretations people were making of what L.E. thought and wanted and the esteem they ascribed to these beliefs about him. To me, they were just my grandparents, but to others, they were Mr. and Mrs. Maxwell, and for some reason, that was a big deal. As I viewed my grandfather through the lenses of others, I became afraid of him and wrote to our parents in Nigeria. A few weeks later, a letter arrived addressed to my grandparents from Dad. We sat down for supper around the tiny kitchen table. Grandma opened the letter and began reading it aloud. Dad told them I was afraid of Grandpa and asked him to please do everything he could to not add to my fear. I was mortified. And then I saw the look on Grandpa's face. The look of sadness and love was profound. I decided then and there that nothing especially the elevated interpretive views that others had of Grandpa would cause me to be afraid of him. My fear of this one who loved me hurt him. I did not want to hurt him. It came to a crisis in my heart when a teacher said to me, How dare you talk in class? You are the granddaughter of Ellie Maxwell. I poured out my frustration to God and the releasing thought that followed had to be the voice of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter that you are the granddaughter of the president. What matters is that you are the daughter of the King of Kings. This was such a life-giving truth. I walked free. I really liked the fact that this morning you sang that song, You Are My King, Amazing Love. That's a beautiful song. You see, coupled within this disciplined dynamo of a man was one who knew how to temper truth with grace and love. Grandpa and I went on from there to form a fun-filled relationship. I learned what he knew. A loving relationship with God is based on the work of Christ, not performance. L.E. loved his family. L.E. and Pearl had seven children and 23 grandchildren. Seeing the grandchildren come in as students warmed his heart. In my senior year of Bible school, we were preparing for the big music night event. This involved one crazy long evening 
with a full rehearsal. In Bible 4 class that day, Grandpa gave us a big section of search questions due the next day. The class groaned aloud. Without thinking, I shot my hand up and when called on said, But tonight we have music rehearsal. There was a long pause, and then he said, All right, no homework. Be thankful for the power of a grandchild. The class applauded. I'm grateful I had him as a teacher without losing sight of him as a grandfather. I asked him once if there was anything I could not do as a woman. His answer was quick and clear. Absolutely not. Whatever God wants you to do, do it. It doesn't matter that you are a woman. What matters is that you use the gifts he has given you. I never heard him deviate from this. He had a sweet tooth of note. Ice cream, honey, and mints were regulars in his diet. If asked if he would like a little ice cream, he always responded, No, I want a lot. Grandpa's esteem and gratitude for staff, students, donors, alumni, parents, and friends of Prairie was immense. What would we do without our friends, he often said. He never tired of hearing about and being with these amazing people. To him, all staff were equal, valuable co-workers, and he thanked God for bringing each one to Prairie. He valued prayer and this praying community. I have a story I was going to insert, but I heard a new one this morning, and I want to tell it to you. Mike Oliver, who runs this dining room when it's running normal, and I see him walking over there, told me this morning that when he was a child, living in some, a row of houses down over here, at 7 in the morning, there were many mornings, his dad would get him up to go outside and meet L.E., as together and then together they would walk down to the boiler house and grandpa would pray with the team that was there going off the night shift and with the team that was coming on praying for their safety I don't know if you know but there was a big boiler explosion and a fire in the boiler house during one of the early years here grandpa would meet with that team every day to pray he valued prayer and this was a praying community that had an impact on him the classroom was Ellie's place of greatest privilege. By April 1980, his voice was weakening. His steps were slowing down, his eyesight fading, and yes, his mind was slowing down as well. But when he entered the classroom, he rallied. Hence, he was still teaching at 84. When the senior class stood to honor him at the end of his last Bible 4 class, he said, I thank God for these 58 years of teaching. Things do come to an end. I would gladly pay people for the privilege of teaching them. Then with his infectious joviality, he added, if I could just get them to listen. With him, the welcome mat was always out. Over the years, I wandered into Grandpa's office for quick conversations. Sandy Sandever, his secretary, always encouraged me and others it was okay to pop in. Sometimes I, like others, would walk with him, or I'd stop in after chapel at their house to have coffee with Grandma and him. Once, when he needed to go to Foothills Hospital, he asked if I would drive him. I asked him what he was learning at this point in life. Immediately, he responded, I valued my life over much. And I'll admit, I didn't know how to respond at that point. Looking back, I think he was saying there are times in life when the message of the cross and dying to self gets tested at the most basic level. I don't know, oh, at that time, he was facing an uncertain future. The value he placed on his life was being refined. I don't know when the value we place on our lives will be tested, but I do know that God uses circumstances to reveal our values and refine them as needed. Although not easy, we must accept God's refining process, and that's what Grandpa was doing. What is God refining today? In this COVID context, is it freedom of choice? Is it rights? Is it control? 
Is it security? We don't know. What, but God knows what the value is that he's refining. As I look back on Grandpa's statement, I take heart from his words. I realize God was giving him grace for that refining process. God always gives us grace to journey with him and to allow him to keep refining us. What Ellie named as the biggest shock of his life came on January 30, 1982, when his eldest son and daughter-in-law, Ernest and Frida, our parents, were killed on an icy road near Valley View, Alberta. I remember two things Grandpa shared at the funeral, and I will admit it took several days for him to be able to say this, but Jesus journeyed with him. The first thing he said was, there has to be something worse than having a firstborn son in heaven. And then he turned to us and said, when your mother and father forsake you, unintentional though it be, the Lord will take you up. He wanted us to know God will fill the gap. He wanted us to have hope. The Maxwell home was his haven. Quietly but solidly, Grandma was always present often laughing, always praying, alert and listening. Grandpa hated it when Grandma went away because the house felt like a barn to him. Knowing this, Grandma prayed God would take Grandpa first, so she cared for him, she could care for him to the end. God granted her request. Eventually, Ellie became bedridden with Parkinson's. He struggled with walking, with the feeling of being alone and with pain. My calves are bawling, he would say. The boy from the farm was still inside him. He reached into his farming vocabulary to describe with humor the pain he was living with. Grandma and a faithful team of men cared for Ellie through the progression of this disease until Grandpa passed away in their home here on campus, February 4, 1984. Grandma Maxwell lived nearly nine more years. So in conclusion, what might Ellie say to you in this centennial year? I'd like to paraphrase what he said to the grads in 1955. Out there is a world who needs the gospel. They need to see the life of Christ by the Spirit of God lived out in you. Make your choices to find and address the greatest needs of the world and maintain those choices. If there are some who cannot go overseas and there are good, valid, God-given reasons why you should not go, may the Lord keep you here, and may he make you more usable here than you would be there. Endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ until the king says, well done. So during this centennial year, may you be grounded in God's word, empowered by God's spirit, willing to be crucified with Christ and raised to new life in Christ. May you go on to love God, prepare to meet the greatest needs of the world, and in so doing, you will make him known, and you will invite others to be lovers of God. God bless you.